moisture that's in the air up to a higher altitude where it's much colder. The uh, moisture begins to condense into water droplets, but the updraft is so powerful that the water is carried to extreme altitudes where it freezes. And it begins to fall, and as it falls, it, it starts to be caught up in the updraft again, so it's circulated up into the air again. And so each time it's, it's lofted up into the atmosphere, more of the moisture that is condensing on the outside of this, this nuclei of ice begins to form another layer and another layer. And each time it's caught back in updraft, it goes up again and it gets another layer of ice. And so if you have a system like HARP working in conjunction with aerosols, uh, chemtrails that are spraying in the air, you can actually create updrafts that are so powerful that you can have these hailstone circulation patterns going over and over again, where you get hailstones the size of baseballs or even softballs. strategic desire to control by the generals, whether it was uh, uh, Napoleon marching towards Moscow or Hitler in his Russian campaign, or our own Pacific fleet trying to uh, understand typhoons and use them uh, for our strategic advantage. War and weather are very closely connected. And they've been connected ever since about 1812 or so, maybe earlier than that. Hannibal had to face the snows in the Alps. And so there's a long history of weather and warfare interactions. Environmental manipulation is like the ultimate um, method of covert warfare, because you can literally shut down food production. You can create a situation where the people within the country revolt against your own government. And you're invited in to mop up the mass. The issue of owning the weather by 2025, which is a military publication, we quoted it as far back as, I think, 94, 95, even. Um, but you go back to these earlier reports, 